Right, hello and welcome everyone to today's meeting of City of York Council's Area Planning Subcommittee. Uh, my name is Councillor Andrew Hollier, um, I'm the Chair of the Committee and I'm joined on screen by the other 10 members of the Committee uh, who are all denoted by CLLR in front of their names. Uh, we'll also be joined variously by Planning, Democratic and Legal Services uh, Council Officers and potentially uh, should the need arise by technical staff, but hopefully not. Uh, officers not sort of currently participating in the meeting will have their videos switched on. Uh, but if at any point we ask an officer to the to the virtual table with us, um, if I could just ask if they'll switch their videos on uh, and to state their name and job title when they first speak. Uh, we have just one item on the agenda today. Um, we'll start with a presentation, an update from uh, planning officers. Uh, that will be followed by an opportunity for, for members of the public and interested parties to address the committee, uh, after which the committee will debate the proposal um, and come to a decision. Uh, at various points throughout, uh, after the presentation, uh, after each public speaker, uh, members of the committee will have an opportunity to ask uh, questions for clarification. Uh, and just to remind members, uh, just to request to, to speak, if you could raise your virtual hand uh, and to ask a supplementary question, if you could raise your physical hand to the screen, I'll be able to see who wants to speak. Uh, as well, when we get round to voting, uh, we'll for the avoidance of any doubt, be conducting a named vote uh, and I'll ask the democracy officer to conduct that uh, when we get to the, when we get there. Uh, and yes, lastly, just to remind members not to leave their screen during the item. Uh, moving on then, I think we've got just one apology for the meeting today with Councillor Kilbane uh, substituting for Councillor Webb. So welcome to Councillor Kilbane. Uh, and I think if we move on to the agenda properly then. So if there's any declarations of interest, if members could uh, I can see Councillor Fisher. Thank you. I'd like to declare a non-prejudicial interest, uh, non-pecuniary interest in item five, in that a close friend of mine is a member of the St Andrews Place Residents Association who have objected to the scheme. However, he has not been consulted. He has not expressed a view on it. So I don't feel it prejudices my ability to make a fair, unbiased uh, decision. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I can't see other any other declarations. So I think next is the minutes of the last meeting which is 15th of October. Uh, members are happy for me to sign those as and when we're next able. Just give us a wave or a thumbs up. Looks, yep, fantastic. Uh, next then is public participation but we don't have any speakers under the general remit of the committee so I think we're able to move straight on to the to the ed proper agenda um, which is item 4a. And if I could ask if, if officers could give us a, a presentation, an update on this application. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Gareth Arnold. I'm the development manager uh, within the development management team. Um, I also have Jonathan Kenyon uh, with us today, uh, who's the planning um, case officer for the application. We have a full application and a listed building consent application for uh, effectively the same scheme. Um, we have a, a written update which was circulated to members earlier today. Uh, Jonathan, can you just briefly go through that, uh, please? We'll, we'll deal with the update um, first off. Um, yes, thank you, Gareth. Uh, so to run through the update that was circulated, just to clarify on page 33, there's a needs to be a correction, and that's on the listed building consent application. It should say the recommendation is to refuse um, update from officers. We've got some comments from highways from on the most recent scheme. They've just uh, raised a query about the waste collection arrangements because of the location of the bins. Um, they've suggested that it's unlikely that the council's waste services team will enter the site to collect the bins. So there would need to be a, um, a management strategy there where, whereby the bins were, were taken out, um, placed outside for collection, obviously brought back in again so they didn't obstruct the uh, the highway. The conservation architect has provided us with some more comments. Um, these are in reply to the applicants' recent comments that were circulated to members earlier on in the week. Um, in reply to, the, to, that, to that note, um, the conservation architect has just stressed that the, uh, the significance of the drill hall is not entirely the external appearance. Um, they're saying the uh, 
the spatial qualities and plan form are, are also of significance, i.e. that's the, the internal layout of the drill pole itself. Um, and that they stressed that this would be lost as a consequence of the proposed housing scheme. They've also reiterated that in, in their opinion, um, there would also be harm to the exterior of the building as well. Uh, this is as a consequence of the, the roof lights that are proposed on the drill hall on the, on the front elevation and the replacement windows that are proposed to that elevation as well. That's all, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'm not going to share my screen. We do, do have uh, a lengthy, uh, quite a lot of slides to show, slides to show um, uh, members who, who came along to the video, the virtual video uh, site visit yesterday would have, uh, would have picked up the complexities of the site. Hi, Chair, it's Chris. Clearly having a couple of problems with Gareth's connectivity, so we'll just give him a minute. Yeah, is um, Becky in the background? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Hi. Fantastic. I'll step in just a second. I'm going to share my screen. Can you give, Chris, can you give me um, co-host, please, so I can share my screen? Two seconds. Sorry, just bear with me just for one second. I can't get access to the presentation. This is going well, just a second. Okay. Two seconds. Right, it's loading. Just a second. Just bear with me. Right, this should be about to work. Yep, eventually. Yep, that's that's yep. come up. Phew. <laughs> Just two seconds. Just need to get it to load to the bigger screen. Has that now gone black? Uh, the the screen's gone blank, but not not black. Right, uh, so done it. Eventually, done it. Okay, right, okay. So, Jonathan, you might have to step in here and explain anything that I'm not 100% certain about, so just be on. Available. That's fine, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've, we've got right. some slides toward the end that show various elements in more detail. Right, um, I'll go through, can talk through Brilliant, yeah. thanks, Jonathan. So, the first slide is your application site and the red line plan, as you can just see here. Just around here and slide two is the roof scape as you can just see there that's to give the site a bit of context here yeah Ed, so can we just stick yeah. on that one a minute becky just to let members sort of yeah, try and understand the, the context because it's probably the best because it's quite complicated on the internal side to understand what what's happening um and i don't know if you can use like the laser pen but the in terms of the, the, the drill hall is obviously the, the building with the, the, the biggest roof and the roof lights that you can see there. Um, and then and then to the uh, to the side of that, you've got the building with the dual pitch roof that sits in the courtyard. Now that's the building that's proposed to be um, retained as part of the scheme and converted into a house. And then the, the, the rest of the, 
that internal area is is uh, flat roofed buildings that are mainly single story, uh, some two story, and they're the buildings to each side of that dual pitch. They're the buildings that are be to be demolished. Uh, and then to the right hand side of the screen, the, the building with the mono pitch roof, that's the, the building that extends from the back of the drill hall. Uh, again, that's that's one that's proposed to be converted into a, to a separate house. So we'd be opening up that courtyard area and um, revealing more of the rear elevation of the drill hall and, and those single story and flat roof buildings that would create more of a, a courtyard amenity space for residents. And then moving towards the other side of the drill hall, you can see the um, you can see the lower roof building, which is the is the link that connects between the drill hall and and twenty eight A. Uh, these are the buildings that were introduced um, in the eighteen seventies to connect twenty eight um, and have that connection through in into the drill hall. And just by there, there's some some more single story buildings that are proposed for, for demolition at the back of the back of twenty eight A. That's the shop at the moment. So we can move on now then. Thank you. Okay. Right, there you go. So that that, that, that one helped. That's a, a section through that um, with that dual pitched roof building in the middle. Again, this shows how the, the single story buildings more or less encapsulate the whole of that entire uh, courtyard area so you can essentially you can see that the ones with the flat roofs are the ones that are proposed to be demolished as part of this scheme so as you look at your screen on the right hand side you've got the the building at the back of the drill hall uh, and then to the left of the screen is is 28a which is a building that fronts onto king's square the the other one the sec the, the one the drawing below is a section of the drill hall that shows the uh the floor plates that are in there at the moment so you can see the the, the first floor that's been been inserted in there and, and the mezzanine floor that stops short to the uh, gable end okay. this is just we've got the uh, the various demolitions plans this shows the extent of demolition in in the drill hall uh, we, we can we'll look at these in more detail later so members can understand uh, it shows some of the single story buildings that are be, to be demolished and staircases as well. And proposed proposed plans and again we, later on we can we can split these up and look at the details for, for 28A, the, the buildings behind and the, and the drill hall. You can see how the main entrance is proposed to be retained into the drill hall and you've got that cross open courtyard in the center and the idea is to have houses houses arranged around that courtyard and all the access for the residential uh comes and goes through that entrance to the drill hall yeah. uh, elevations again bit again we can look at these in more detail later in the presentation uh, so it's a bit easier to understand what the key changes are. These ones show again how the sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> that just it just that one that second the lower down section just shows the shows the demolition again in that courtyard area and um, how that more more of the uh, rear elevation of the drill hall would be revealed. It shows the the the, the, the roof lights and the open roof at the top of the drill hall as well. And more elevations of the of the drill hall and the building behind it and an internal elevation of the drill hall okay. we're more of the same you can flick through i think so these are the ones that show in in more detail so this is this is 28a so that's the the, the shop that's there at the moment that faces onto king square um the, the shop with the lighting um, so you can see from this plan, uh, you've got that the entrance door and that kind of corridor that you walk down and then in there where it's, yeah, sorry, screen just froze. So you've got uh, that annotation that's number six, that's the, um, that's the 1870s staircase uh, that's been demolished uh, to allow commercial at, at the ground floor level and residential above. Uh, that, that's where there's been... Uh, strong objection from Historic England to the loss of that staircase and 
uh, objection from conservation officers as well. Um, the other areas you can see there's the single story building that's like the L shape at the back of 28A that's proposed for demolition there. So next slide. Uh, this shows the, the upstairs of 28A, which is storage at the moment. Um, the window on the front is proposed to be replaced um, because of its condition, because of its age, and um, on in terms of achieving better noise levels and uh, better insulation for the building. But again, that's been objected to by conservation officers. And a domestic plan form is reinstated at that level. It's all, it's all open. Uh, all the internal partitions have been removed at the moment and the staircases at the back uh, are retained there that go to the upper floors. So again, they're from a similar date to the, um, the staircase at the ground floor. They're all contemporary with the insertion of the drill hole. This is the layout plan form of the building at the right at the back of the, the drill hole. Um, again, there's a staircase removed in this building, it's where, the, where that bathroom is at the moment. Uh, I don't know if we could appreciate it from, from the side visit, but it's quite, an, it's quite a narrow building. So the staircase has been relocated to the, to the center to allow us to have rooms off both sides of that staircase. That's more evident on the, uh, on the next slide. So you can see how they get bedrooms on both sides of that staircase. Um, there was a question about daylight when we did the site visit yesterday and out the limited daylight and outlook to the, um, the ground floor. So those, the ground floor, it looks out onto the courtyard from two different sides, but this L shape that wraps around the right hand side of bedroom one, um, that's where you've got a row of roof lights um, that's going to allow natural light into that main ground floor living space. Next slide. So this is the uh, demolition plan that focuses just on the drill hole. Um, so you can see the, the extent of, of the demolition there. Um, the building as, as we know it at the moment, all that remains are the, are the, are the surrounding walls, essentially. Uh, the, 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 the floor plates that are in there at the moment are taken away. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention, there's a, there's a staircase, uh, as you can see next to that door number two at the top that's retained. Uh, but otherwise, uh, most of that is taken away to in, incorporate the new use and that the roof is replaced as well. The next one. So this is the uh, zoomed in um, plan form of the, the proposed residential development. So sort of St. Andrew Gate is at the top. So that's the main entrance. And you can see how you can, you would be able to move through the building and get into the courtyard. And we've got the cycle storage there. And these eight houses in there are arranged around this central courtyard area. So next slide shows upper floors, I think. So this shows how in revising the plans, the applicants have tried to, because there's obviously an objection to the loss of the spatial quality of the hall. They've, they've, they've initially the, the, the houses wrapped all the way around the, the, this courtyard and they've, they've set them back. So they just run parallel to both sides. So the gable ends at each side are, are, are opened up in this, in this new layout. So when you're in the courtyard, you'd be able to see through to each side of the building uh and on the roof albeit a new roof so that's illustrated a bit more on the next slide as well so this this section shows how that's how that's achieved so in the middle there you've got the you've got the the new open roof and the courtyard uh, and you can see from these other lines how the, the sort of two rows of houses are arranged around that courtyard and how they've almost got their own roofs that are sort of independent uh from from the main from the main roof Another thing this section shows uh, are, the, are the windows and how that first floor level is is set away from the windows. Um, that's to that's to get the natural light in into the building. But again, it's to try and reveal um, the scale of of the building and the character of it by being able to sort of fully appreciate those those external windows uh, within within a residential use. Okay, that's next link. Um, and this this shows again this shows the spatial qualities of the building at the moment. So these are the the two gable end the, the gable ends that we can see in the mezzanine floor. So the intention is to, as we've illustrated on the previous plans, to um, sort of reveal reveal these gable ends in the in the new layout so people can appreciate that volume. Next slide. 
Uh, this is a closer image of the proposed front elevation of the drill hole. So this shows that the, re the proposed replacement roof with with standing seams. It's not it's not fully accurate, probably, and it's it's a detail to be agreed later on. But we'd be looking to probably line through the standing seams of of the roof with the louvers of that open fented section just underneath the ridge. Uh, so, so it looks more continuous. You can see below those, that open section, the new proposed uh, roof lights that are, that are fairly tall that sit low, close to the parapet. Uh, again, these have been objected to by Conservation and Historic England because they don't feel that they're in, that, that this kind of roof light is not in character with the uh, traditional form of the building and it's more solid roof. Um, the windows at, at ground floor level there proposed to be replaced and this gives you an idea of the, the proposed fenestration pattern for those windows. Um, again, that's something that our conservation has objected to and they feel that the windows that are there at the moment are, are more traditional and preferred. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Uh, this gives you a bit more information about about the roof. So there's a kind of precedent image that shows, gives you an idea what those louvers would look like on the roof and how you'd achieve a um, openness and, and fresh air while still giving the appearance of it of it being solid. So in more distant views, it, it looks solid and more traditional. The, this is the, the image on the right is the roof lights and that's the manufacturer's literature of those. So that shows the variable formats of those roof lights so they can be completely closed or they can fold out and open so they kind of form balconies. And again, that's something that members need to be wary of that, that that'll be, they'll be evident in, in the street scene and they're somewhat uncharacteristic of the building. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's the main entrance. That gives you an idea of the, the, how the windows are at the moment. And we can go on to the next. And these are some uh, indicative images from the design and access statement that hopefully give you a bit better of an impression about the what the new windows will look like, how that new roof will appear. Although the um, just the, the gable end, the, the, the chimney's missing from that. That's not part of the scheme that would stay. Just notice that. And the, the other image is how that internal courtyard area would, would look and how we've got the amenity spaces on that upper level with the, with the gable ends revealed. And the next one. That's it. Oh, okay, a few. Okay. And that's all, thanks. And we should have Gareth back. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I did have, after spending all afternoon um, preparing that, that's, um, um, did we, uh, sorry, uh, did we talk about the, the issues that were raised at the meeting yesterday, just then? Yes, I think so. So Jonathan's showed us the extra slides. Yeah, so, I saw those. It was the issue, um, Councillor Galvin raised about the plaque on the front of the building. All right, no, I don't think that's been brought okay. up. So, if you've... Um, so the plaque, um, so, so Councillor Galvin pointed out that there was a memorial plaque um, or a commemorative plaque on the front of the building. Um, that's, uh, as, as far as we recall, that's not shown to be retained on the, on the submitted plans. Um, so if members, were minded to approve the scheme, wish to see the plaque retained, um, they would have to, uh, the condition would have to be placed on that, um, that consent to retain that plaque. Okay. Um, I think at this point then, just to invite any questions that members might have at, at this point, um, see Councillor Melly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I had two. One was um, a supplementary to that. I was just wondering um, when talking about the plaque and the clock and that sort of thing, whether that is a matter for the full application or the listed building application or whether we're taking them both as one. Uh, we would normally take two separate votes because they're two separate applications, but because they're intertwined, um, interlinked, uh, we would normally consider them all discuss them as one as one item um but um but yeah two two separate votes uh as to um whether that will be one for the lbc or the full um it could be either i don't right. think 
because it's on the outside of the building could be covered by both my suggestion is probably the lbc would be more appropriate but um it could be either thank you and my other question um relates to paragraph 3.1 of the report on page 15 um the comments from the conservation architect um in that paragraph it says that um the the plan, uh, the harm to the significance of the listed buildings of these plans is less than substantial. And then it goes on to say that they're categorised as high. And um, I was just wondering if we could have some clarification of which it is, because I think um, the advice of the conservation architect and what the level of harm is, is going to um, probably inform our decisions. So it'd be useful to know if the harm is less than substantial or above substantial. I think what the what that what's what that is saying is that it's within the category of less than substantial, but at the high end of less than substantial. Um, so uh, members will uh, recall from the training um, that when discussing um, impacts on listed buildings, um, you have to uh, you have to consider the level of harm. Um, so uh, total loss or um, significant harm, um, you'd look at it in, a, in, in one way. But with um, paragraph 196 of the, uh, of the MPPF says that uh, where a development proposal will lead, lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal, including where appropriate securing its optimum viable use. Uh, and what the, what the what the conservation architect is saying that even though it's less than substantial harm, so we'd be considering it under paragraph 196, she considered this is at the high end of less than substantial harm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Craghill. Thank you. I just have two questions. I'm just actually wondering if I've misunderstood something here, but um, I know there is some concern from residents about potential alterations to the the bollards in front of the drill hall, which I was taking to mean the closure of the street bollard, you know, the bollards that close the street around that point. Is that, I just wanted some assurance that 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 won't be altered, that, that that the street will remain closed at the point it is at the moment um, to to vehicle traffic. That that was the first question. Yeah, that's my understanding. Jonathan is um, that's correct. The uh, the bollards are uh, obviously it's within the uh, remit of the highway authority. Uh, the applicant has no no rights to move those bollards and. Uh, our, the the view of the highway authorities they should they should stay where they are because um, uh, they're positioned to allow uh, servicing from uh, King Square rather than through from uh, um, through from Old oh, Walk yeah. and Spen Lane to, to property to commercial properties on yeah yeah so, the, so commercial yeah. properties don't get yeah. um, uh, don't get serviced from um, yeah. Uh, through the residential areas. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. And um, the second one was um, just again, um, just to give assurance to residents who've been concerned about overlooking um, um, whether that's onto the back of gardens of properties on St Andrew Gate, um, or also there have been some concerns, I think, from the properties opposite the drill hall on. Um, sorry, back of gardens on, in St Andrew's Place and also properties opposite the drill hall on St Andrew Gate, number half St Andrew Gate and the houses next to there. Can you just respond on sort of concerns about overlooking? Uh, Jonathan, can you come in on that one? Um, yeah, sure. Well, since the... Um... Since the scheme was first submitted and we had the first round of consultation, we had at roof level, we had quite big outside amenity spaces and balconies. So residents could have been outside on that roof behind the parapet. So I think that was one of the main reasons why uh, neighbours felt they might be overlooked. But those that element of the scheme has been changed to these uh, roof lights now. So the, 
there would there would be if if residents were to if the new residents were to open out those roof lights and stand out on those fold out balconies that there would be some they would be able to indirectly see toward the bedroom windows at the houses at the back of the drill hall and they would be able to look over St Andrew Gate again opposite to look at the, the windows in the house houses opposite um but we, we didn't feel that that was an unacceptable arrangement in what is a fairly tight-knit city centre location where you've obviously got a lot of buildings uh, in close juxtaposition with each other. Uh, we didn't feel like that there'd be any undue overlooking or loss of privacy as a consequence of those changes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Colwick, have you got a, a follow-up here? I think rather than let him try and mime it out, if we move on to Councillor Wardby and we'll come back to Councillor Colwick shortly. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a really probably a silly question, but um, it says in 3.14 about um, monitoring for the public noise from the public house. Obviously, in the current lockdown, um, obviously we can't monitor. Um, will it be looked into at a later date or? Um, please. And my second question is concerns of residents about um, these being holiday lets. Is there anything in, to say, uh, like a condition to say no holiday lets? Thank you. On the um, on the noise from the, the pub, the applicants felt that the noise assessment, uh, they sent some later clarification in about that and they, they felt it was a adequate representation of what the noise environment would would be like i believe public protection were equally as concerned with the various plant and equipment that's at the back there because the the, the outside area at the pub is very small um but we, we were content that there was enough information in the noise report that the noise levels would be acceptable as some details to have acoustic screens um around that kind of wrap around that that outside area um that would keep the noise levels at a reasonable reasonable point we we haven't got anything in the report about holiday lets and we, we wouldn't normally I don't know if you want to add no, to that Gara. It, it is a um it's a subject that's come up before uh, before um subcommittee um uh, my my view is that uh if we to put a condition on removing um otherwise um available use rights to, to the applicant. Uh, it tends to be something that we would normally require to be um, evidenced and hung on a, a, a planning policy. And we, we don't have planning policies which, um, which, which say that um, new residential uses can't be used as holiday lets. Uh, so on, on that basis, I would, my advice would be for us uh, that there isn't uh, the evidence that um, that would be a necessary and reasonable and defendable position at this stage. It's that point about reasonableness, isn't it? And being consistent in that, why, why is it any different for this developer of this particular site compared to any of the other houses that we've, we've had in the city centre because we haven't got any transparent policy to, to explain to people how we're acting in that respect? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Corwick, do you want to, to try Thank again? You. Thank you. I just wasn't able to uh, uh, unmute myself at that moment. Apologies. Um, what I was going to ask and will now is, is just, just to be clear, we saw manufacturers' illustrations of the roof lights with the centre of three panels opened. Uh, so it was uh, creating a standing area. Um, it wasn't clear from that picture whether all three of those panels opened in a similar way thereby creating a, a more substantial uh, open area there. Um, is that the case? Is it, is it the design that simply the central panel would open in order to provide, provide this, this, this standing area? Or is it a more substantial uh, opportunity to open all three of those uh, windows as we saw in the manufacturer's illustration? Yeah, the, the, the illustration was to show the different permutations as to how the windows could open so as the proposal is at the moment 
you could have any of those permutations for all of the, the windows. So you, you're right in that there's a potential there that they could fold all of the windows out and have a continuous sort of wide balcony. That's that's how it's shown at the moment. Um, it, I guess if we got to that point and members had issues with that, uh, you could specify that we looked at other products or we could possibly suggest opening restrictors that would prevent uh, the, the full extent of opening. So there are, there are things we could look at if you thought that was necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Galvin. Chair, um, it's just a bit of clarification, which it's following on, I suppose, from Councillor Melly at 3.2 on page 15. Um, is the conservation architect suggesting that the large hall couldn't be built in at all? I mean, I find I find that quite remarkable, really. Um, can we have some clarification? Just what does that paragraph mean? They would they would prefer for um, a, a less intense scheme that that had fewer units and that was designed in a way that better sort of retain the the whole like qualities of of the building. So I can't paint you a explicit picture, but that the, the the issue with the scheme at the moment is that it's very much taking a, a series of townhouses and, and dropping them into the uh, retained shell of the drill hole, as it were. So that the, the preference from a conservation perspective uh, w w would be would be different different types of houses introduced into into that plan form in, in a more sympathetic way. But it would it would mean a, a, a very completely different scheme to, to what we've what we're presenting to at the moment and as you're aware there are there are there are viability issues with the project thank you chair and thank you jonathan um it does seem a little bit ridiculous to me but that's life thank you uh councillor fisher thank you uh thank you chair i think i might be taking a question away from councillor craghill at the moment but uh paragraph 552 the bream requirement which we're getting is very good and the 28% carbon emissions reduction requirements. Can I just ask, how can you actually s judge what is a reduction when you're comparing a building that at the moment is in retail use to one that's going into domestic use? What is the actual baseline for assessment of that? Because I think to understand the insulation levels, we need to, you know, which obviously we want to be as high as possible, we need to have some guidance as to what we're comparing with. Um, it's So it's not comparing it against the building as it is at the moment it's um it's a notional domestic building uh, and it's compliance with building regulations so it's basically if, you, if you're building a house what the building regulations ask you to do you've got to you've got to better that by 28 percent. so it, it discounts the, the condition of the, of the building at the moment thank you for that that clarifies what i want to know thank you thank you uh councillor oral yeah just following up from that, that chair, it would be helpful uh, in reports if we got far more detail uh, of what the uh, environmental requirements are in the BRIAM report. We get a little paragraph here which doesn't tell us very much. Other areas of the report, archaeology, transport, we get very detailed uh, responses to that. So it would be helpful if we got more details uh, of what's being proposed and how things are going to be achieved. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I guess we can speak about that after after the meeting and see what we can do there. Uh, Councillor Craghill, sorry, did you did you have another question? I assumed it was a, a sort of hand left up from before, but is it another? No, it's it's left from before. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Councillor Kilbane then. Oh, thanks, Chair. Can I just check on the um, affordable housing? Clearly, there's no affordable housing on, on site. Has, has the developer refused any affordable housing at all, including off-site? Um, that's correct. For a, for a development of this size, i.e. between 10 houses and 15 houses, our, our starting point through policy is to take a contribution off-site, and especially in cases like this where we've got quirkier developments uh, that, that wouldn't necessarily 
fit with what a registered provider wants. So the ask has always been for a contribution towards offsite. Um, the, the starting point in the policy that we have is uh, just over £30,000 per unit. Um, but we, we've got we've got zero. There's no offer in between zero and our policy requirements. It's just nil. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Oral. Uh, my question's just been answered, Chair, and it's 30,000 per unit, which gives us an indication of the total uh, contribution. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw, do you want to? Thanks, Chair. Um, I, it's just on this point as well. Um, obviously, if the um, council would normally expect around 30,000 per unit and the developer is um, saying that they're not prepared to provide anything, um, could you just outline what the usual process would be to uh, negotiate that um, difference of, of opinion and how you would ordinarily uh, reach a, a mutually agreed point? We would... Uh... Our normal, if if we if we can't come to agreement between the the parties, i.e., the council and the developer, we'd normally defer to the district value who gives independent looks at it independently for us and is an expert in in the field. And they would normally they'd let us know either whether it can comply or not, or whether whether in their view for for a nominal scheme like this, whether there's some money left over in the pot, if you like, after a reasonable developer profit that that should go towards affordable housing. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw? Yeah, thank you. And, and so why has that not happened in this situation? We would, um, we, we've asked the developers if we can go through that, but the, 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 we asked that the developer, according to the policy, the developer meets the cost of that. So it's not something that the council can afford to pay for or would do in, within every scheme. And the developers rejected um, that. So we've not gone through that process. Thank you. Councillor Crawshaw? Apologies. Um, uh, uh, what, what, what's the ballpark for the cost of going through that process? I, I appreciate it might be different for each scheme, but is, is there a, a rule of thumb that says it is about this? I'm struggling to give you a number off the top of my head. That's, it does vary for the complexities of each scheme and how much uh, negotiation is, is involved. Um, but it, it's obviously in the thousands of pounds. I can't remember what exactly it is and it's it it's not just the district value that we need to engage we probably need to involve quantity surveyors for, for a complex scheme like this to look at the build costs as well so it, it can get fairly expensive and in the thousands of pounds but thousands rather than tens or hundreds of thousands yes i hopefully it won't go into the tens yeah thank you thank you uh councillor fisher Thank you. This is on the same point. It says the, in paragraph 535, the applicants have also provided a viability assessment to illustrate the scheme is not viable. Is that in the domain that we have been able to see? Because I've been looking for it and I couldn't find it anywhere in the list of documents. So I just wondered, is that available for councillors to look at to see whether we think it's viable or not? It, there hasn't been. It was confidential, I believe. I think that all we could we could do was would be to ask the developers for a, a summary that includes the non-sensitive sort of headline costs that they're willing to include to, to, to share with you, but it, we haven't made it public at the moment. Yep, Councillor Fisher. But officers have seen it thoroughly and been able to do a full, full assessment of whether they think it's reasonable or not. Uh, yes, but to the to the limits of our ability, because obviously we don't have that in-house expertise within within the council. We just have an understanding of it from uh, different colleagues in different sections of the council and our experience with other schemes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't see any more questions at this point, so I think if we move on then to our public speakers, um, and we've got six uh, members of the public speaking this evening. Um, they should all be able to hear me, so I'll just say that uh, everybody will get three minutes each to address the committee. Um, I'll give you a warning at 30 seconds, um, and then after, after you've spoken, um, you'll essentially be taken out of the meeting um, 
but you'll still be able to continue watching on the council's uh, YouTube channel. So if I could ask if uh, Mr. Paul May, if you're there, uh, Mr. May is speaking in objection. Can you hear me, Mr. May? Okay, if I could ask then if, if um, technical officers are able to try and get Mr. May back to us. And if we move on to uh, Mr. Richard France, if you're with us. Good, uh, good evening. Thank you. And you're uh, the developer speaking in some uh, support of the scheme. I'm Indeed, correct? yes, my name is Richard France. I'm the managing director of the OK Group. Thank you. And if, um, yeah, if, like I say, you've got three minutes to address the committee and um, if you'd like to start in your own time. Thank you. Well, approximately three years ago, Paul Thompson of Barnett's and I discussed the then changing face of retailing and the fact that Barnett's needed less trading space but required investment in the fabric of the existing buildings for the future. He identified the drill hall as being surplus space at the rear of the store and 28 Colligate as being part of the disposal for access reasons. We subsequently explored many different types of uses for the grade two listed accommodation, including offices, hotel, leisure, and none were viable options. The proposal for 10 high quality townhouses, two apartments and a commercial unit became the only viable option to return enough capital to Barnett's to enable significant reinvestment in the business. We recognize the importance of affordable housing in York and fully support it. But at the same time, we recognize the importance of keeping businesses in the city center alive, as well as giving new life to grade two listed buildings, ensuring their economic survival for the future in this historic city. All this comes at a cost. The restriction of developing within the listed building with a retained facade in the city centre severely impacts on construction methods, working by hand, constrained sites, access, and significantly impacting on time and therefore costs. The Oakgate Group has completed many d difficult building projects in the York city centre and have substantial first-hand experience of the costs associated with them. We recently completed the construction of Scala Yard off Fosgate, a four townhouse in the studio flat, and the eventual certified building cost was twice that of a standard new build townhouse scheme. Unfortunately, the planning department have been advised on generic building costs from the RICS building cost index, which isn't a true reflection of complex construction methods required within the listed building in the heart of York. Similarly, comparable sales values have been taken from quoted asking prices which are significantly different to those actually achieved. It's been suggested that advice should be sought from the district value and other cost consultants. This undoubtedly would create further unacceptable delays, especially when our sales and cost figures have all been certified by, by professional qualified charter surveyors. We are not avoiding the affordable housing issue, it's just that the evidence we have provided demonstrates it's not viable in this case. With COVID dramatically changing the retail world, the city centre is under the severe pressure from a vitality and viability 30 perspective. 30 seconds left. By approving this application, members will be clearly seen as supporting retailers in the, in the city, and in this case, ensuring that a future lifeline for Barnett's is secured quickly and without delay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I would, if you want me to refer to the plaque and the bollards and the the short-term letting, I'm quite happy to do that either now or else when I'm questioned. Yes, yeah, so we'll see if there's any, um, if you could just hang on a minute, I will just check yeah. if there are any questions. Um, I can see Councillor Crawshaw, if you'd like to. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and I think I, I appreciate what you're saying about COVID, but I, I think we should just note that this application went in in December of last year. So, you know, quite significantly before COVID was on the horizon. But, you know, there is obviously uh, a long term issue around uh, the viability of, of city centres and, and what have you. Um, I guess what I really wanted to understand from you is um, the report suggests that you're expecting to make a 20 percent profit on this development, which is at the top end of, of what we would expect most developers to make as a profit. Um, you're suggesting that there is no 
grounds to be able to uh, deliver affordable housing. And, and I think, you know, we would all, always expect uh, an affordable housing element within this sort of a scheme. Um, I don't quite understand why you're refusing to pay um, for an independent valuation uh, office agency report that we've, could settle this quite straightforwardly. We've never refused to not pay for the district valuers. This was only brought up late in the uh, in the negotiations we had, and we felt it was far too late. And bear in mind, I think the planning uh, office had been given some indication. That's why I've said, look, you know, using the RICS building cost index is not appropriate because it's it's a generic uh, system. It doesn't take into account uh, dealing with listed buildings in historic cities and very confined sites. And similarly with sales, because they were quoting sales figures to us, which were completely and utterly uh, wrong, that, because they were asking prices. In fact, they quoted a number of sales figures that were on developments we had done ourselves. So we knew what the, the prices we achieved, and you can get those from the land registry. So we've never not said we wouldn't deal with the district value, but what we have said, this is incredibly urgent uh, now, because this has been going on for a very long time. The application went in in, in uh, December, but we had been negotiating for most of it for a year before that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's taken a long time. And I would, I, I would certainly say, obviously, COVID's had an effect. But before that, city centres were struggling. Retailers were struggling, left, right and centre, as I'm sure Mr. Thompson will, uh, would uh, uh, verify, but I would I would I would certainly say that we are. Um, if it went to the district values, it just in, in increases more delay, which means uh, we, Paul Thompson cannot um, cannot uh, uh, plan for the future. So, uh, and I'm sure I'll leave it to him to tell you what what the, what the impact would be for him if we don't get a decision uh, reasonably quickly. So, so just for clarity and, and with permission, Chair, um, delay notwithstanding, you, you would have no objection in principle to going to the uh, valuation office agency. I have it's no objection in time. principle, as, as, but I, I, have, I have an objection to further delay. That's the, that's the biggest okay. problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Craghill? Uh, thank you. I actually had the same question as Councillor Crawshaw has just put, and I, I would just follow that up by asking Richard if, if this committee were to defer the application on the basis of asking you to go to the district valuer, would that be um, something that you um, would then do? Um, I think that's a very uh, difficult... Uh, my initial reaction would be no, because I, th I think you know we've demonstrated amply that um, it is this is not viable. I mean, I've got I can tell you now I've got just over eighty eight thousand, ninety thousand pounds in various education open space contributions uh, for the uh, for this. And now then, I'm quite happy for it to be renamed for uh, for um, uh, affordable housing. But um, the scheme. And by the way, we're not making 20% profit on it either. Uh, but the, the scheme is, uh, has taken a long time to um, uh, come about in terms of we've, we've had to pare down quite a lot of the, uh, uh, the space. So we've, we've reduced the amount of space we can uh, uh, sell effectively. And the costs have gone up substantially with various... Um, uh, construction uh, elements that the conservation office and planning officer want to see so costs have gone up and sales space has effectively gone down so the, the, the viability is getting worse by the minute to be honest okay. thank you yeah thank you uh, councillor oral so you've got a, a supplementary a follow up to that chair richard you've got lots of experience of doing these um development how long you say it's going to be delayed if, if we go to the valuation officer your experience how long does that valuation process take i, I don't know how long the value i mean i'm being informed i was informed by our own team and 
bear in mind we did uh, give a full viability statement with our planning application which obviously uh has for for i presume for public uh public reasons has not been included within the papers um but the viability the, 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 it show it proves that there isn't the viability there but um we are you know how long the district values would take i just don't know and uh, i know paul thompson will be extremely concerned because he needs to plan um uh, and we're we're there with him and you know it's just it's unfortunately it's been going on for for quite some time and we're very grateful for getting it to the, to the meeting now but um it's a uh, it's a very difficult uh, situation that we've you know got to balance up it is you know currently it doesn't make enough money to to do it and the 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 result could end up being is that you know the development doesn't happen uh and barnets don't get uh, any further money to reinvest in their current building Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Councillor Colwick. Thank you, Chair. Um, I fully appreciate that the goalposts are constantly moving, but it's also true to say that uh, in recent uh, times, the last certainly weeks and months, um, very often sales have been uh, even at 5% and in some cases 20% more than asking prices. Um, so goalposts are constantly moving. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to uh, to answer the questions that you yourself uh, raised at the very end and said you'd be happy to answer questions about bollards and plaques. So please go ahead and do so. Right. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Re um, referring to the plaque, we would be retaining the plaque. Um, so it would be retained as part of the uh, as part of the fabric. Um, we suggested moving the bollards because um, it was actually in conjunction with Barnets because they felt that a lot more currently a lot of people actually park outside a lot of the St. Andrew Gate place residence and then go walk into town. And if, it, if the bollards are moved further up, then effectively that that is less likely to happen. Having said that, we had a meeting with the St. Andrew uh, Gate place, uh, Andrew Gate residence uh, at the end of last week or beginning of this week, I can't remember which, and we agreed that you know they didn't want the bollards moving, so we said, well, we're quite happy to leave them where they are. It's not, neither here nor there. Uh, and finally, on the short-term lets, the, the properties will all have one share in the freehold and there will be uh, a covenant in the in the freehold for each property that they will not be let for anything less than short uh, than, than anything less than sh I think, what do they call them short hold short hold tenancies which is not they cannot let them for anything less than six months which is a standard that we we have put on a lot of our schemes for example Stonebow House um, and that w that prevents any Airbnb and short term lets and holiday lets and everything else and so it's it would but it would be owned by the the owners of the entire uh, of all the uh, residential units within the scheme uh, so but we would put that covenant on uh, when we're selling them so it, you know that that's as much as we can most probably do actually legally um, and finally, I'll just say that um, we sold the last flat on Stonebow uh, during lockdown and we got 15% less than we were asking. So that was the, that was the difference of, of, of the COVID. And I, I do hear people across the board, but it's, it's like all these things, it's, it's, uh, some prices are going up at, in some places on some properties but not elsewhere. And I don't think you can take it as a general rule of thumb. Okay, thank you. I've just got a couple more questions then. Uh, Councillor Galvin. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very grateful that you're going to keep the plaque. It's quite insignificant uh, in the scheme of things that we've had so far, but it is quite important. And if you want to know the history of it, I'm quite happy to give you at, at a future date. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you uh, Councillor Galvin. Castle Crawshaw, then. 
Thanks, Chair, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to ask another question. I just want to delve a little bit more into, into the um, financial side of this arrangement, and I appreciate some of it will be commercially sensitive and, and some of it maybe not uh, directly planning in one sense, but I think it does it does matter in, in our assessment of this um, application. So you're essentially contending that um, this development needs to go to head go ahead in order that Barnetts gets the investment to make Barnetts uh, continue to be a viable business in the city centre. So would my understanding be correct that in effect Oakgate is the developer that is either optioned the land or will purchase the land and it's from that deal that Barnetts gets an investment and then you develop the site and you take your profit out in terms of the, the selling on of, of the uh, development uh, you know in, in due course. Exactly correct. Yes, indeed. I mean, okay. and the um, that we well, Paul will most probably be telling you that he will be reinvesting in you know, better access lifts in the existing buildings and basically doing up uh, refurbishing and maintaining the existing buildings uh, because they do need some TLC and he, he needs the capital to do it. And so just for clarity then, essentially what, what we're saying is that if this application is refused and you don't develop or don't have the opportunity to develop the site, you don't uh, sell or you, you, you don't buy it from Barnett's and Barnett's, Barnett's lose the investment. Yes, correct. Yeah. So can I just then understand a little bit more because the report does say 20 percent profit is is what you're aiming for and you you then said no it's not actually 20 percent profit no, um, not, no so well so so what what are you anticipating and and again i appreciate um commercial sensitivity but there's a percentage profit you know there'll be a ballpark actual we were we were we were aiming we were aiming for 18 right. and that has gone down substantially since uh, because of re recost, that's what we were originally aiming for, um, and that's profit on cost, not on on value. Um, yeah. And we were aiming, and, it, and it's now uh, uh, a lot less than that currently with the scheme we've got, because of uh, we've got less uh, space in terms of apartment space, which is obviously less sales value. And various costs have increased with um, with the negotiations, and uh, we'll have to then do some you know some proper value engineering when we get if we get planning. We'll have to seriously look at the value engineering side of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, Councillor Craghill. Thank you. I was going to ask a completely different kind of question, so I better I better I'll stick to that anyway. That, that's interesting discussion about about the costs and the and the profits, though. Um, my completely different question was from what you said, Richard. Is it correct that there will be a management company? Because I I also wanted to ask that in relation to the additional information we had today about. Um, the refuse being taken out and that it needs to be yeah. managed properly. Indeed, it yeah. It is quite an issue good. in that location. It, it is. And I, I, wrote, in fact, I wrote that down, Waste Collection Dash Management Company. Yes, the creation of a management company. So each uh, occupier will have one share and they will uh, the, a management. They'll have one share in the management company, which will own the freehold, and they will have effectively a small service charge because... There is an air, obviously air, common areas that have to be cleaned and lit, and obviously refuse will have to be taken out, which most probably I suspect they'll get somebody to come and do on the appropriate days when the waste uh, can be collected. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And having said that was the last question, two more have sprung up. So, Councillor Galvin, then, is this a supplementary? No, I'm afraid it's something a little more pressing. Could you have a 30 second recess, please? Yes, of course. Um, I'll, I'll only be 30 seconds. I won't turn off. Okay. I think probably the best. Sorry, um, Mr. Francis. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Francis. Yes, we're just um, hanging on for a brief 
a brief break, yeah. but um, no worries, no worries. We'll be back shortly. I'm guessing the best thing for us all to do is just to stay in our little boxes. Um, yep. Sorry, Councillor Oral. There's no escape. Yep, yeah, we'll just hang on for a, a minute or so. Thank you. Um, thank, yeah, you well, thank you, Chair. That's, I think it's called The Relief of Mafeking. <laughs> well, welcome back. <laughs> yeah, I, you didn't miss anything whilst you were gone. I think we can, can safely Nothing say that. <laughs> uh, so, Councillor Kilbane, then, would you like to... Oh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. France. Can I, can I just check that I've got this right, uh, Mr. France? What, what, what you're asking us to do is... Ignore our own rules. Ignore Section 5 of the MPPPF. Don't have any um, affordable housing provision out of this application so that Oakgate can make its full profit. No, I think you're getting that uh, uh, slightly skewed. The, the viability policy uh, allows that no affordable housing needs to be uh, provided for if there's, the viability doesn't work and this is a situation and this is you're not we won't be setting a precedent by doing this uh, because it's it's done it's been done many times elsewhere but what I'm saying is this is a very complex building it's very expensive to develop and it's the the monies are going to a very, you know, the best store in York as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, if we can't get enough, uh, as it were, capital to Barnett's, then then it won't happen and the, the, the development will effectively not happen. Um, and afford, you know, having uh, been held up for, uh, because of the, the costs, and you, know, you, you have to, appreciate the, the the cost of building in the city centre in a grade two listed building where basically most of it will have to be done by hand. Um, there's not going to be you know great big cranes there. Uh, it's it's is a very expensive, it takes longer and because of that it's very, very costly. Um, and uh, I think that you know that has to be taken into uh, has to be taken into account. Jay, you're muted. Apologies. I was just saying, I can't see any further questions, but you also have a question. <laughs> I just had a supplementary on that. Um, doesn't the logic of that argument, Mr. France, mean that you're paying too much to Barnett's? The logic would be that. We, we struck a deal some time ago, and uh, we've been you know, working towards that uh, for some time. And... What I would say is that you know we we you know we we have a very good reputation in York as you most probably know, uh, and when we strike a deal, we try and keep with it. But where we've got a situation now that uh, we're losing we're losing effectively losing sales space and costs are going up, then viability you know starts getting squeezed enormously, including you know our profitability. But, but, uh, sorry, we, with with respect though, if if you've struck a deal and you've made a deal with Barnett's and then the market's changed, it shouldn't be the uh, affordable housing contingent, the the most vulnerable people in the city in some respects, it, it, that are losing out on on 
I, I, I quite agree. I quite agree. Uh, but it was from from day one, the viability in terms of affordable housing wasn't there, and it's got worse, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Now I really can't see any further questions, so I think we'll just um, thank you, Mr. France, for your time this evening. And as I mentioned before, um, our technical officers will sort of take you out of the meeting, but it'll still be available to watch online. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you. indeed. Um, if we could then ask, try again, Mr. Paul May, um, and you may need to press star six, I'm told. If you're there, Mr. May, if you could press star six. No, I don't think we're having any joy there. So if we could move on then to uh, Mr. Phil Pinder. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Um, yeah, and you'll have heard, I'm sure you've You've spoken before you've got three minutes and i'll give you a warning yeah. at 30 seconds but yeah if you could start no in your own time yeah thank you so um hello um you need to speak at a planning meeting usually uh, economic meetings um but yeah basically i think uh this is not just about um obviously a planning application this is about the future of the high street um my city center the council is undertaking is all about looking at developments like this and encouraging development that to take place now I appreciate um, the need for social housing, but in this instance, it's been a very small development, and as uh, Mr. Frank, it's a very complex development, a grade two listed building, then affordable housing is not going to be what they can do. However, what this is doing is this is bankrolling, you know, the of Barnet. Um, it's no surprise to the panel that obviously Barnet's have taken a step due to falling footfalls in the city centre. Lots of shops, you know, including John Lewis on Oxford Street, are downsizing their um, retail space um, where they own the, the, the freeholds and uh, making that into uh, more considerable other developments to basically put some cash flow back into the businesses. Um, we need to do this in the, because, you know, Barnett's is York's favourite store. Don't forget that, you know, locals in York consider Barnett's their, their favourite store. And many people have many fantastic memories of Barnett's. Now, I'd be crying shame if... You know, we've watched from recently, we've had the you know, collapse of the high street three years ago and the, the ongoing crisis there. You know, COVID has actually taken a third of incomes away from most retailers this year. Now that's going to mean that next year our high streets are going to look very different. There's going to be lots of retailers that disappear. And it would be a crying shame if we lose retailers like Barnett's because they can't find the funds. Now, Barnett's haven't had anything, any grants from central government. The scheme basically didn't allow for larger shops like Barnett's to receive any government support other than by loans. Um, obviously, Barnets employ 40 plus people, and I'm sure as you're all aware, because you probably all shop in Barnets, you know, they're the same faces day in, day out. You know, Barnets is not some kind of job. These are jobs that people have had for decades. Same faces I've seen in Barnets in the last, you know, 15 years that I've lived in York. Um, and, you know, you come to know these people and you come to rely on their advice. So I'd urge you all to support this application today without any conditions. And let's get the investment needed in the fantastic store that Barnett is. Thank you. Um, just going to ask the committee if there are any questions at this point. If you just hang on. No problem. Uh, I can see Councillor Crawshaw. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I think it's it's uh, not really a referendum on uh, how popular Barnett's is or isn't. I don't think there's anybody in the city that uh, doesn't. Uh, cherish Barnett's as a, as a, as a, uh, a shop in the city centre. Um, I, I guess what concerns me, uh, Phil, is, is that we're being asked to waive uh, the affordable housing contingent on this development in order to allow a financial transaction to go through that enables Barnett's to, to essentially make a profit or, or, or at least, uh, you know, get some capital from from buildings that it owns and I, and I fully appreciate how difficult trading in the city centre is at the moment but if this one is allowed to go through in this way uh, will you be coming in six months time when say Browns is having difficulty and they want to convert the top floors of Browns to residential and 
don't want to make an affordable housing contribution or any other long-standing York business in the city centre. Uh, I'm, I'm just not clear about why Barnett's is special and should be given uh, dispensation to not follow the normal um, sort of policies that we, we have as a, as a council, in particular when actually it, it would appear from speaking with Mr. France earlier that actually it's the developer that would be seeking to um, maximise its profits or make the, 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 the scheme as viable as possible and actually the sale price maybe isn't contingent on that. But yeah, I think you've missed the complete point there. I mean, listening to the discussion myself, I mean, I'm no planning expert, but from what I gather, it's been a grade two listed building and with any grade two listed building, you know, it's very difficult to to basically convert them. And they are they start off unviable and they end up costing more money than you forecast. You often use far in excess of your um, overflow reserves. And uh, to be honest, it, it you know, doesn't go ahead. It'll probably... It, Sort of so, it, else but, so, you know, these so, developments, you don't want them. But, you know, it's the grade two listed nature of York City Centre that stops this being viable for affordable housing. And they are rules that are set by the government. And Barnett's will be using, you know, the money to invest in the store and make the store disabled friendly. So you're basically saying you don't want the store to be disabled friendly. Uh, no, I, I think you're very much putting words into my mouth there. Um, just to be clear then, so, so you're saying that this is... Uh, the grade two listed building rather than the investment in Barnett's because I think we need to separate out in planning terms there's a sale that may or may not happen which is really nothing to do with the planning committee and then there's the planning application for a, a development of a listed building. Sorry what's the question? Well you, you seem to be conflating uh, the viability of developing a listed building with a financial transaction that would happen with, with Barnett's. And I'm just seeking a little bit of, of further clarification there because what I'm saying is that if we enable a, a, a planning application to be approved that goes against the planning policies that the council has on this occasion, because we happen to like the business that would be selling the land, how would we look at another business in the city center and, and not do the same for them if they were equally as important to the to the city centre. Uh, well, exactly the same way that Mr. Francis outlined before. You do it on viability, and if the, the project was viable to do that. So essentially, what we're saying is that we potentially wouldn't be able to deliver any affordable housing from any complex development in the city centre. Well, you know, you, now you're putting words in my mouth. What I'm saying is, you need to take every project at its aims and see what the you know, the smaller the project, the more unaffordable it is. The larger the project, the more affordable it is. You okay, know, so you. I think we have to we have to take every project as it comes along. Thank you. Um, Councillor Melly. Yes, I just wanted to clarify kind of further to Councillor Corshaw's questions. Um, you were saying that it isn't appropriate to expect an affordable, um, affordable housing contribution from a development of this size. Are you, are you saying... Are you suggesting that it's the policy of requesting a contribution towards off-site affordable housing for developments of this size that's incorrect or unreasonable, or just that this particular application is a special case that then should be and should be this exempt? This particular application is a special case as outlined in the application. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions. So, um, similarly, I thank you for your time this evening and. Um, officers all sort of take you out of the meeting in their usual way and uh, you'll be able to thank carry you, on Catherine. watching online. Thank you. Uh, next on the list then is Mr. Paul Thompson, um, if you're there. Uh, hello. Sorry. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, evening. Uh, it's um, Paul Thompson, the Managing Director of Barnet. Thank you. Um, yeah, and you'll have heard you've got three minutes um, to address the committee, and, and if you could start in your own time. Uh, I'll read from a statement. My, my name is Paul Thompson, and Barnett's has been in my family since 1913. It has been a shop in York since 1896, and over the last 124 years uh, has had to adapt many times to keep it viable, relevant to changing shopping habits. 
We have built a business that is well loved by residents and connects people with the city centre. We, we've become York's convenience store. However, over recent years, customer needs, habits have changed considerably and ri- rise of internet shopping, out-of-town stores and new technology. To safeguard our future, to keep the iconic Barnett's name in the city centre, we again now need to change so future generations can enjoy the Barnett's experience. To be clear, this application is crucial to the future of Barnett's in the city centre. We bought the former drill hall building about 25 years ago. We needed to expand our shop floor space to survive. Then, 25 years later, the market has changed again. We now need to contract our shop floor space for the reason I've already said. In current situation, the businesses, retail business have all been hit hard, ourselves included. This is why this application is crucial for us so we can reinvest income into creating a better, more modern shopping experience. That will include a lift for accessibility, uh, reconfiguring the shop and layout and use our space more efficient that we have left um, and create an environment which is excellent for staff to give a good service. We already have permission to for a new click and collect store concept at James Street, which we will co- complement the city store centre. The changes outlined in this application allow both our proposals to move forward. The James Street store will also mean we can significantly reduce deliveries and lorries into the city centre. However, this application is decided. I I will be vacating the former drill hall by the spring of of next year. It will be left left empty uh, and it's no longer able, as it's no longer available as a retail environment. Um, this will reduce my overhead costs and it will help the store survive. We also need the certainty of this decision so we can plan for the future. The 30 seconds left, sorry. will help safeguard as many jobs and for the local that we employ, as well as ensuring that we can stay in the city centre. I tr- truly believe a sporting applicant throw to competent city centre and the challenging times and show the council commitment to a long-standing York business to make the city a great place we live, we live and work. I would urge the future of Barnet City Centre to process, uh, breathe new life into the former drill hall building, which is in ne- need of major investment, and um, that's really what I can say. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions about the scheme or and the application if you want to, um, if you need any questions further answering. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you. And I'll just ask the committee if anybody does have a question they'd like to put at this time. Um, I can't see any. I think we have had quite a good go at questions over the past few speakers as well. So, mm-hmm. um, yep, I can't see any questions. So I, I think I'll just thank you for your time this evening. Yep, um, that's thank you. Uh, and yeah, you'll have heard you'll have heard how the the process works. We've taken out the meeting, but you can continue watching online. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, then we've got Mr. Andrew. Sorry, we'll try again, Mr. Paul May, if you're there. Hello. Hello. Can you hear Hello. me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Um, <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, sorry, there are huge problems, but. Uh, uh, well, let's hope the vaccine works so it's still normal, normal Zoom meetings. So we're glad to have you now. So if you've got your three minutes and um, I'll give Okey you one in seconds. So please start on your own time. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, I live uh, with my wife at uh, 3 St. Andrew Place, which um, immediately adjoins the Barnet premises. Um, I have a number of objections to the proposed conversion, but uh, which I've already submitted, but I'll limit my comments today to the uh, eventual occupation, the future occupation of the housing units, if you approve planning permission. Um, Several objectors have raised the possibility that some or all of the resulting units might be occupied on a short-term basis, in other words, holiday legs. I fully accept the developer's assurance that they don't want to see such an outcome and that leasehold conditions could include restrictive covenants prohibiting rental lettings of less than six months. But I do fear that market realities might ultimately frustrate their uh, undoubtedly good intentions. Um, Unlike um, most residential uh, developments in uh, the centre, this scheme has no provision for car parking or individual gardens. Um, I've no particular axe to grind as a lifelong 
non-driver, unlike my wife. Um, but uh, you may be aware that a recent report about the housing market in York by the property website Zoopla uh, said that uh, the three most common search terms from p- potential buyers in York are, quote, garden, garage, and parking. Um, it's unlikely, I-, I feel, that there'd be significant interest in buying or rented the properties from families with children, uh, retired people, or, or uh, for that matter, younger sharers. Um, as, uh, as you will undoubtedly know, property prices and rents in the centre are notoriously high. Um, it m- may well turn out that holiday lettings are the only viable market for these properties, uh, which brings the prospect of antisocial behaviour in a currently uh, peaceful thoroughfare while making no contribution whatsoever to York's uh, serious shortage of permanent housing. Uh, For various reasons, this scheme is opposed by Historic England, the Council's Conservation Architect, Guildhall Planning Forum, Sir Andrew Place Residents Association, individual uh, local residents and your own planning officers. So uh, in conclusion, I would urge members to reject this application. Thank you. Hello? You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Yeah, just ask uh, members if there are any questions you'd like to put it put to Mr. May. Uh, Councillor Colwick. I was struggling again with that. Uh, Mr. May, thank you so much for your uh, your your contribution. Um, living in the area yourself, can you just clarify? You you have a garden. You have parking. Uh, yes, uh, we have a very small garden, but a, a garden it is. Uh, my wife is an avid gardener, and uh, uh, we uh, have um, carports. Um, despite that, um, uh, St Andrew Place has, I think, 42 housing units, mostly townhouses. Um, only three residents um, uh, have children, uh, uh, and that's with gardens and with um, carports and um, for some residents' garages. Um, and I think that's the case for most residential developments in the in the uh, city centre but as you say only some residents have garages or parking places uh, most, by no most, means all uh the only residents who don't um have uh, integral uh, carports um are uh, there are I, f- I forget how many i think there are four flats on the estate um but they they actually have access to garages on the development Thank you. Thank you. Um, can't see any further questions. So similarly, I'll just thank you for your time this evening, Mr. May. Right. Um, thank you. You'll be able to, to carry on watching on YouTube online. Uh, could we then move on to Mr. Andrew Lawson? Hi, can you hear me? Hey, yes, we can hear you. Um, and similarly, you'll have heard there are sort of three minutes to address the committee. Uh, I'll give you a warning at 30 seconds. And if you could just stay on the line uh, after you finish, just in case the committee have got any any questions. But... Yeah, no problem at all. No problem at all. I mean, obviously, yeah, I'm making a comment in support of the planning application. And um, I mean, I suppose standing back from this individual, individual application just for a minute, um, as we've already heard, it's clear that city centres across the UK are changing. Traditional retailers come under threat for a variety of reasons to do with how people use their leisure time. Out of town shopping centres uh, have obviously been developed and the internet shopping has significantly increased its market share. This trend existed before COVID-19, but what COVID has done is increased the speed of this change exponentially. Data that the bid and the City of York Council have purchased from Visa show that online sales increased 245% during the spring lockdown, and that's just in York alone. We also know that online spend is often not supporting local. The fact uh, uh, the impact of COVID-19 has seen a, a net loss of 7,834 retail units across the UK. That's just in the first half of 2020. That's 53% more than the first half of 2019. So the message from this is clear. Retail businesses need to be able to adapt extremely quickly in order to survive. 
From my perspective, that's exactly what violence is trying to achieve in this situation. Um, they want to keep a presence in the city centre, which is something which I think we all agree is welcome news in the current climate. Their plan not only looks to improve the store offer, customer experience, which is something that's vital in the battle against online, but significantly upgrade the building's infrastructure in what's a historic part of the city. This concept of diversifying retail stock is happening increasingly across the UK. The city centres look to adapt, often via breaking down large units, increasing residential housing, which in turn brings people into the city centre supporting the retailers there. The importance of this concept has been a driving theme within uh, the council's led My City Centre consultation. For a long time, you know, businesses have been talking about you know, the need for a city master plan, a process that allows businesses, developers and the community a common understanding of how we're looking to adapt York for 21st century living. It is not only that this reason is viewed, well, it's for this reason this, this is viewed as a real test case as to whether the city is you know, serious about helping local businesses adapt. Barnett's due to its size is an anchor store for York, very similar to the likes of Phoenix or m uh, I've already heard from Paul, it has a proud family history. And for many, for many people, it's synonymous with the city centre. And to lose Barnett's from York would obviously be an absolute hammer blow, um, which is why myself and Bid strongly support this planning application. I think for it to be refused um, or majorly delayed, I think... 30 seconds, uh, sorry. Yeah, sure. For, for Barnett's future to be left unsecured uh, would send out a hugely damaging message to the businesses, residents and those who visit from further afield. I think it would also harm the credibility of the My City Centre conversation um, as it would be difficult for partners to have faith that the ambitions of this process can come to fruition in the long run. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, yeah, and if you could just hang on for, for a minute, I'll just ask a committee if anybody's got any questions. And Councillor Crawshaw. Let's go first. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, Andrew. Um, I, I'm slightly concerned at the way that the um, future viability of, of Barnett's based on a sale is being conflated with a planning application and uh, whether or not the developer of that application should be allowed to uh, not uh, make its affordable housing contribution. And I, and I appreciate what you're saying about the message about the, the viability of the city centre. And, I, and I'm sure that every councillor on this call would, would want to do everything they possibly can uh, to, to support the city centre. But what sort of a message do you think it would send out to the residents of York if we say that a developer can ignore its affordability, uh, its affordable housing obligations, because we want to uh, enable a sale to go through that enables another completely independent business to do whatever that independent business wants to do with its with its capital receipt. I think, um, yeah, I appreciate Johnny. I mean, you know, there's been things, obviously, details from the, the report and the planning application brought up today that obviously you know I haven't been privy to before. Um, you know, and have to confess, you know, the ins and outs uh, over the years is, is not something which I've, I've, I, I can comment on uh, on greatly. I suppose the key message for myself today is I think, yes, because this is such an iconic store in the city, and I think there will be a lot of eyes on this, I think that is why this is drawing a lot of interest. Um, I think, obviously, you know, on, on the viability of the, the social house, uh, on the affordable housing, I suppose all I'd like to see out of this, having heard you know, comments on both sides today, is hopefully that there can be a situation that's, that's, you know, well, that this can be rectified as quickly as possible. I think, I think the speed of a decision is probably the thing which uh, I'm, I'm the most keen to see. Now, how the technicalities of the reports, because you know, obviously I've heard both sides today, again, I have to confess it's, it's very difficult for me to make a conclusive judgment on that myself, having heard both sides of it. But I think for me, the key thing is understanding, you know, the fact that this is going to be, uh, uh, you know, well watched from the business community, the fact that I think speeds are the essence. And I think, you know, the overarching message when I've spoken to Barnett's is this is a, a plan, a viability plan that keeps them in the city centre. And that's the reason uh, that I want to speak tonight uh, with all due respect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I can't see any further questions from the committee. So, Yes, yeah, similarly, just thank you for your time this evening. Um, you'll be able to carry on watching on the on the council's YouTube channel. Next, then we've got Mr. Bill Woolley, who's speaking in support.
Yes, hello. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we can hear you. Um, you'll have heard as well a few times that you've got uh, three minutes to address the committee. I'll give you a warning at 30 seconds. And if you could just hang on the line after you finish speaking. Um, but if you'd like to make a start in your own time. Thank you. Uh, York's historic core has many listed buildings and it's vitally important that the pressures of development do not compromise the important work of conservation that's needed to protect our heritage. That said, the redevelopment and reuse of buildings, including listed buildings, is key to maintaining a vibrant and successful city centre. The former drill hall in St Andrew Gate is such a building and what followed the decision to dispose of the building was full engagement with the city's planners, conservation architect and historic England over many months and everyone has agreed that residential is an appropriate reuse. This is a complicated proposal but I note that despite the continuing reservations of the conservation officer, the planning officer has now concluded that on balance the scheme being considered today is justified to facilitate residential reuse and regeneration of the building. The recommendation for refusal is based on a lack of affordable housing contribution and in my view this relates directly to the conservation requirements. The former drill hall was an open space with an internal balcony at the north end looking over the hall. After the Second World War the army undertook radical changes. They removed the orig original steel truss roof including the gable facing onto St Andrew Gate and they subdivided the hall with a concrete floor at first floor level cutting across the windows and in destroying the internal balcony. In other words, the hall lost its open internal space over half a century ago. When the drill hall was listed in 1997, this was done without an internal inspection. So the fact that the interior of the drill hall did not retain anything like its original volume or any historic features was not given any consideration. Despite this, the Council's conservation team and Historic England have sought to recreate something long gone by insisting that there is an internal open space from ground floor to roof level and from gable end to a new and reconstructed gable end. Whilst all of these demands and more have been accommodated within this application, they have, of course, had a significant impact on the cost and value of the development, as you have heard today, and the ability to fund an affordable housing contribution. I do not, however, believe that in approving this application today, that the committee will be setting any form of precedent as a full and professionally certified viability assessment has been provided in accordance with the requirements of the council's affordable housing viability policy. It's 30 seconds the policy left. was adopted specifically to deal with situations like this and has been used properly many, many times over the years since it was adopted. I therefore hope that the committee will feel able today to support this important development. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Um, just ask the committee then if anybody's got any questions. No, I can't see any. So similarly, um, I'll just thank you for your time this evening, Mr. Woolley. Um, to be able to continue watching online. Thank you. OK, um, I think it's probably wise to take a break at this point. Um, if we could all try and aim to be back for quarter past six. Um, guess if we could just turn off our videos and join the join the breakout room.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, I think we're then we're straight into questions. If anybody's got any points they'd like to raise with um, the planning officers, if you could raise your hand. Uh, Councillor Kilbane. So, um, th thanks, Chair. Uh, we heard from the applicant that um, they'd not refused to go to the uh, district valuer. I wonder, um, which seemed to be in contradiction to what we heard earlier, so I was wondering if there were any comments from planning on that? I'm bringing uh, Jonathan in as the case officer with the, uh, the greatest day-to-day -day involvement in this particular case. Yeah, sorry, thank you, Gareth. Um, well, the last, the last conversations we had were similar to us uh richard france said earlier in that they they weren't keen on involving the district value because of the um the time scales involved and the reluctance to involve any more delay in moving forward to decision making uh councillor crawshaw i think you want to and then councillor melly thank you chair um could you just give us an indication of um what the normal time frame is uh with going to the district value between Submit. I presume you you submit a request and and they gather details and then and then come back with a report. What's what's the time frame on that usually? Um, it, it very much does vary depending upon their workload. Um, but uh, from the from the day one, in terms of them agreeing and, and providing the money, it, it will probably be um, within about two to three weeks. We'd we'd hear from the district value as to when when they thought they'd have time to to look at it and when we could expect a report. Um, so I'd, I'd say in, in the region of two months, but that, that could move one way or the other, depending on how busy they are. Um, Jonathan, is it it's reasonable to say that we, we did um, send uh, our rebuttal to the, uh, the viability report um, a number of months ago and um, before the first, uh, the first lockdown? Is that the case? Yes, it was. It was back in February that we initially went back to the developers with some observations, and it was obviously apparent that we weren't in full agreement uh, with, with their with their viability appraisal. And um, they did come back to us later on with that, but that we were still in disagreement. And that this is the point when we would engage the district valuer because we don't. We can only base it on our experience from other schemes and. As I said before, that the district value is the expert in the field, whereas we're, we're not. And the developers, again, the developers know more from working in the field than us as well. And that's why we usually we defer to the district valuer to give us that honest, independent appraisal that, that we can uh, we would go with. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Melly, did you also have a follow up or was that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of check. It, from my understanding, the developer had said that one of the reasons to not want to go down that route was that it was proposed quite late in the process. I just wanted to check that that is to be expected because by the very nature of it, um, this route, uh, you don't go down it until you know that it hasn't been possible to come to a mutual agreement without having to get somebody independent involved. Mm, well, it, it set out in our policy and the, the planning agents acting for Barnets know if, if there's disputes and we can't come to a resolution the district value is involved as standard and, and we communicated that to the to the developer quite some months ago I'm not sure whether that made its way to the the agent who's talking at committee now but we we did tell the planning agents that was the case before COVID basically. Okay thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Oral. Thank you, Chair. Same question as Councillor Croshaw. I should have asked a supplementary. Councillor Colwick. Thank you, Chair. Um, just some clarification. The suggestion was made, I'm not sure how seriously or, or, or how seriously we might be able to, to regard it in terms of the, uh, the planning obligations that uh, are recognised that include for uh, open space contribution and also for educational provision, and that in total is only just shy of eighty thousand pounds. And I think the suggestion was made uh, was it by Mr. France that that uh, some or all of that could instead be labelled as affordable housing. Um, just some clarification. I'm assuming that it isn't quite as simple as that, uh, but. Um, how, how is it that these 
contributions have been happily accepted um, when the affordable housing contribution uh, seems to be so problematic. Is that for us as officers or? Uh, I mean, either, I either, as, that... either as officers yeah. or, or from a legal uh, perspective on whether it's uh, a simple matter, as seemed to have been suggested, that we just relabel this. Well, I, I guess from the from the, de the developer's point of view, I think the position they're giving to you is that that that, that is the amount of money that's in the pot that's excess uh, that they can afford to give, basically, and and it's for ourselves as officers and members to 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 balance and weigh that up. If 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 you were to accept that as an overall amount, what, what do you feel that is most important um, and which in which direction can the money be used best whether the need for affordable housing and what that amount of money can deliver overrides that the need from education that may arise from the development and and what that money could deliver in that respect as well and if anyone else wants to add anything further to those comments no i think that's uh, that's a good that's a good summary um uh, as to why the developer chose to to say yes to that, uh, presumably because the figures were were set out and in front of them, uh, but um, I, I couldn't put words into the developer's mouth as to why they why they said yes to to, to the education and the uh, open space rather than saying no to those and and yes to a proportion for affordable housing. Um, as Jonathan says, they may they may well have left that up to us as planning authority to make that to make that decision. Thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions. So if we're happy to move then into, into debate, um, if anybody would like to advance an opinion. Uh, Councillor Craghill, got in first. Okay, I'll have a go at this first. Um, my opinion is that, that, that there is a huge amount about this application that, that is very positive, um, it, which we haven't talked about those bits all that much really, have we, in a way, and there's obviously a good reason for that. But, um, you know, there's a very creative use of, of a heritage building, a reuse of a heritage building, which I entirely agree with some of the speakers is a very appropriate thing to look at in the current situation. Um, more accommodation in city centres and, and the prospect, even despite of COVID, of a changing balance of perhaps retail and, and accommodation um, and the prospect to support retail um the retail that's left to support independent retail such as barnets it's, it's all very positive um supporting a key local independent retailer that's hugely valued such as barnets um and some of the other details such as the fact we've learned there's a management company will be in place um and hopefully hopefully that will in, avoid um, through through the, the conditions in, in the, the covenants and that can avoid the use for short term lets, although it doesn't guarantee it, perhaps, um, and that the management company will hopefully also be able to promote good relations with with existing residents in the area in in various ways so so there are a lot of positives to it um, in terms of the the less than substantial harm to the designated heritage asset, I'd be happy to accept that, um, that the balance of public benefits um, for all, all the reasons we just mentioned does, does outweigh that. Um, the amenity of the new occupants would be acceptable. It's a very sought after location um, and the sustainability criteria could be conditioned, I believe. Um, and, and, and everyone loves Barnets. I love Barnets. But I really think that um, this is a planning application. And it's, there is a requirement that we judge this on the basis of planning policies. And as we've discussed quite a lot, one of those policies is it's there for a very good reason on affordable housing. It's to increase the supply of affordable housing that we need in the city. Um, and the commuted sums we're talking about um, 
you know, we're talking about sums around maybe a maximum of 350,000, but potentially a lot less if the district valuer came up with with you know that assessment as the experts it could be a lot less than that um, in in the wider scheme of the development we're not saying here um, how much we think that community sum should be we're saying that we think it should be assessed by an independent assessor um, and that's what officers are saying as i understand it and i don't think we can ignore this policy simply because it's barnett's um, I think I agree with the point Councillor Crawshaw made earlier on that we, we cannot just set a precedent like this. Um, so I would really like us, you know, to be in a position to approve this application, but I don't think we can do that whilst we have this issue um, about the, the commuted sum and the affordable housing. Um, so I think I would like to put on the table a proposal of deferral of this application to give the applicants an opportunity and I'm not sure whether we would put on how many months we've heard that two to three months might do it we could take advice on that um, but to give the applicants the opportunity to agree to go to the district to the valuation office and get an independent valuation um, so that so that we can take this forwards. So that's a proposal of deferral. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just ask then if anybody's willing to second that. I'll second that. Okay, Councillor Crawshaw. Thank you. I, I was going to make quite similar points actually to uh, to Councillor Craghill that um, you know I, I think everybody recognises it's complicated development. Everybody recognises that um, Barnett's is is seeking to change its business model, and I think we all want to do everything we can to support it. Um, but without that affordable contribution, uh, affordable housing contribution, and, and as the, the um, application stands at the moment, I, I think I would find it very difficult to do anything other than. Uh, refuse in line with the officer recommendation and I very much don't want to be in that position of, of having to do that um, so I, I think that we should be deferring pending uh, that independent assessment and I hope that we can do everything we can internally within the, the planning department to, to try to expedite that I appreciate that it goes to an external independent um, assessor and, and therefore we can't really do anything about that um, but I'd like to see that coming back to this committee as, as soon as is possible so that we're then faced with uh, judging the merits of the application as it is and the public benefits of, of potentially any affordable contribution, affordable housing contribution um, as outweighing the harm that may or may not be caused by the, um, you know, to the listed building. So my, my view would be that we should, we should um, defer. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Colwick. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said by uh, both uh, of the previous uh, members. Um, there's just so much to like about about this and really welcome. Um, I don't know, I may be the only member of the committee, that uh, may not be the case, who's actually been in the old drill hall. It was way back in 1986, I remember it very well. And having seen the, uh, the remote site visit yesterday and the dog's breakfast of the, uh, uh, of the site, uh, what is being proposed, I think, would be a, a huge improvement and great use of, of, of that facility and maintain and improve our appreciation of, a, of a, a, an important listed her, uh, heritage asset in the city. There's, a, um, it, there's, there's, there's so much to like about this, but to ignore our own policies in terms of um, contribution to a, a, a affordable housing just doesn't make, make sense. And whatever the, the history of this and whatever the immediate and pressing needs of the various parties, not least uh, Barnett's, and as, as has been said, we all want to see Barnett's uh, thrive in the city centre and thrive in the city. But um, I, I support what's been said and I'd certainly be supporting a deferral so that we could have that further information and clarity. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Chair. Um, there is much to like about this development. I think the idea that providing 12 residential units is great. 
there's some damage to the heritage of the area, but I think there are also improvements in the demolition of some of the rather unsightly and scruffy buildings around there to allow the heritage asset to be better appreciated. And also, I think it's vital that we do try and help city centre shops to survive. I mean, I've never been in Barnet, so I might be the only person in York who never has. But I understand there are many people who actually have a lot of, you know, happiness about the, you know, the, the fact it's surviving and perhaps adapting and thriving. Um, but it doesn't matter whether it's Barnet. It could be any retailer in York. We have to treat all retailers on the same basis. Now, I cannot accept a viability study put by a developer without independent scrutiny. I may have mug on my face, but I'm not one, honestly. Uh, if they go to independent scrutiny and that independent scrutiny says that it's not viable with an affordability, then we could look to waive it. But at present, I'm mindful to refuse. And I think for the developers, deferral and uh, going to an independent valuation assessment is the best way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kilbane. Yeah, I, I was going to speak in favour of the motion too. Um, obviously, we want this development to go through, but we can't ignore our responsibilities. Uh, and I'm going to suggest, Chair, that we move to the vote. Thank you. I mean, given the number of people that stuck their hands up when I asked for a seconder, um, it may not be a total surprise, but I will just give Councillor Galvin a chance to speak because he's had his hand up before before you put that forward. Jim, thank you. Um... I support the deferral because I desperately want this development to go ahead for a number of reasons. Um, let's just assume for the minute, let's just assume for the minute that it didn't go ahead and that Barnett's moved out of the whole of that part of their premises. Uh, we'd end up with a situation where we'd have a listing bill, listed building could well slowly moulder and get worse as the years go by. I think to defer it, I, I personally would have rather uh, uh, gone for a, 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 an acceptance, a, a, a permission granted, but I, I soon began to realise that the clouds were forming and a lot of in my opinion, extraneous argument was being used because at the end of the day, this development is based on two particular uh, pieces of planning. One is the affordable housing and the other is whether it would get listed building consent. Now, let's not lose sight of the listed building consent because you might uh, decide after it's been done, dealt with by the district valuer or whatever, and it comes back to this committee be looking to approve the planning permission and then we could have a separate argument on the list in building consent so i think in many ways we have to get that squared off first and i think that perhaps perhaps it might be as well to take that item at this point in time at least to give a fair steer because if list of building consent is not agreed to in any shape or form, then it doesn't matter whether planning permission is passed or not for the development of these buildings. So I wonder whether we ought to just consider a minute what we should be doing about list of building consent. That's all. Thank you. Uh, I think my reading of the list of building consent is that approval or refusal of that will essentially depend on approval or refusal of the, the main planning application because in order to approve the listed building consent and say that there are um, public benefits which sort of outweigh the harm, you'd need a scheme which had an approval. So without the approval, you essentially aren't able to hinge the approval of the listed building consent on a public benefit. So I think, I'm not sure whether we, um, I guess we take the vote on the deferral first and then take a decision on the listed building, whether that's also deferred or whether it's refused is presumably a, a debate to be had after after a deferral. Can I answer uh, that, Chair? Uh, having read the papers, and I, I put my hand up and say I haven't read every comma and every dot and every the, it and if, uh, the list of building consent, yes, does make account of that, but it does say about the harm to it at whenever it is, 
I think it was it three. It was following Councillor Melly's bit actually about the conservation ar ar architect on fifteen. Uh, he talks about the loss of spatial qualities, volume, character of the drill hole. So I'm not sure that given planning permission being granted is going to change the argument for listing building consent. I, I would have thought that the two actually linked, but yet separate decisions, if you understand what I'm getting at. I, I, okay, I, I'll go with, with what the committee decides, but I shall be pretty cross if it comes through in the fullness of time that permission is granted, and then we say, oh, well, we're not, oh, well it's been recommended we're not going to list a building consent. Uh, Councillor Corwick, could, do you want to come in here and then I, perhaps I'll come to Gareth just to try and shed a bit yeah. of light on, on what we're talking about? Well, um, I was going to suggest that, that we did that. It may be helpful to have some, some maybe even a legal uh, ad advice might help be helpful at this particular juncture. Okay. Uh, Councillor um, Crawford, do you need to come in sorry. before Gareth? Or? Well, it was just to, to, to point members to the relevant paragraph in the listed building uh, consent application. It's, it's paragraph 5.3 on page 43. Um, which says the identified harm within 28A in the drill hall is regarded to be less than substantial in NPPF terms. Uh, and NPPF paragraph 196 states, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal, including where appropriate, securing its optimum viable use. So until we've established whether or not we've secured its optimum viable use, i.e. delivering residential with an affordable element to it, we can't make a judgment as to whether or not we're weighing that against the harm that we believe may or may not be being con created by the by the uh, changes to the listed building. Thank you, uh, Gareth. Do you want to come in at this point? And yeah, Chair, I think um, your summary and uh, Councillor Crawshaw's summary was uh, uh, summed it up um, summed it up very well. Uh, so we have the. Um, the, the recommendation before members was that uh, the planning application be uh, refused, but only on affordable housing grounds. And the report uh, goes into uh, why um, uh, planning officers feel that the public benefits outweigh the identified um, harm to the to the uh, the heritage asset. Um, the reason why that's recommended for refusal is because it doesn't meet the affordable housing policy. Now, the list of building consent, again, the report points out why officers feel that um, uh, the public benefits uh, could outweigh um, the, uh, the, the harm to the listed building, uh, but points out that without uh, planning permission, those public benefits aren't realised, and therefore that's why it's um, recommended for uh, for refusal. Um, I think uh, you would, in re if, if, if members were moving to a refusal vote uh, just on those, that single ground, um, that would be an acknowledgement that they were satisfied with the impacts of the, uh, the proposals in listed buildings terms. We wouldn't be able to go back and uh, um, if the application was refused um, just on a single ground you, and then resubmitted, you wouldn't then be able to uh, reasonably refuse um, a follow-up application, which was the same impact on, um, on heritage grounds. So um, uh, my, my advice would be that uh, you, would, um, you would defer, uh, you would defer both applications um uh, because it would be uh it would be unsafe legally to approve a, a list of building consent when you don't have those public benefits okay thank you um we do just have a couple more people with their hands up so i'll give them an opportunity just to to say their piece and i think we can move to that vote so um councillor oral thank you chair uh councillor fisher must be the only person in york who's never been into barnet Wonderful shop with wonderful staff. Um, the, what I was going to ask, Chair, if we get a further report, could we have more details on the sustainable design and uh, construction? Okay. To entice um, Councillor Fisher in, they'll need a parrot department, I think. So, uh, Councillor Wardby. 
I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm a bit confused and I just need some clarification. So if we vote to defer this, are we saying that we approve everything about the application? Because I'm quite, quite concerned about the roof lights. Um, so do we not say anything about them so they can go and re-look at them? Or do we... I, d I don't know. I'm just asking a question. I'm really, really sorry. Um, I'm just a bit confused. Thank you. Um, can I just ask Gareth to to give us a view on that? And then Councillor Melly, I can see you've got a, a supplementary there. Um, <laughs> that's a difficult question to ask, answer, actually. The, uh, I, I would I would say that if um, if 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 you don't agree with the uh, if you think there are faults with the scheme which um, either require addressing or would or you feel would make the scheme unacceptable then they should be um, you should consider those at this stage because if you're deferring um, if you're deferring for so we can go uh, and uh, get some more agreement on uh, affordable housing, uh, then um, I would say it's it's better for the applicant to know at this stage uh, whether there are other issues that need to be sorted out as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wardby, did you want to... I just, um, has nobody else got any uh, reservations over these uh, lights? Because um, if they haven't, then there's no point me talking about them. Because I just, I'm just concerned that they can open into a balcony um, and they're overlooking and everything like that. I've just got, got concerns. But if no one else has any concerns, then there's no problem. I think we do have a, a motion on the table, I guess, which is to defer on the basis of the affordable housing. So if we take that vote, I guess we'll we'll find out. But I'll ask um, Councillor Melly, do you want to come in here? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I share similar concerns. I think that um, this application, honestly, is marginal. If we took a vote on it now, I, I don't know if I'd vote to approve or refuse. I think we need to debate it some more. And my concern is that if we defer it for a, um, ind uh, an independent valuer to come up with a figure um, for affordable housing contribution, that may or may not lead to an agreement with the developer. They might still, the, the, the independent value might come back and say, no, they don't need to pay any contribution. They might come back and say they do need to pay a contribution and the, and the um, applicant still declines to pay it. Or, or they might, they've had the opportunity to have an independent valuer and, and so far they've declined. We might defer it and, and the application comes back to us exactly as it is right now. Um, and we haven't had any debate on whether we're minded to, um, approve or refuse we might we, we could have a situation where the applicant refuses to pay any affordable housing and approve it anyway we might have a situation where they do agree to pay a contribute to affordable housing and we refuse anyway um, and I'm just concerned we're going to go through all this again for the exact same application or, or the purpose for deferring won't actually affect the decision and won't be relevant I think there's probably essentially two viewpoints being expressed at the moment. One is that they like the development as proposed, but are concerned that it doesn't meet our affordable housing policy, but are otherwise happy. Um, and obviously, sort of the position, I guess, uh, Councillor Ward being Councillor Melly putting forward, which is we also don't like the affordable housing, but we also have other concerns about the development. Um, I guess to some extent, the only way to test which of those two viewpoints is the majority view is to take the votes we have on the table, um, which is to defer on the base of the affordable housing. And if people wish to debate that further and have a deferral or a refusal with a wider remit to vote against that and put forward another motion. So that would be my suggested way through um can see a few nods so Jareth, I, I, I just make the point that all the issues about the impacts on the listed building uh the pros and the cons um the the drawings have been in front of members for the whole of the uh the uh, the whole of the meeting I, I would have assumed that if um there were significant issues that uh, 
that members had that they they've had the the opportunity has been there to discuss to discuss those issues i think so um i think we are probably at the point where we can take a vote on the deferral that was put forward a while ago um i'm now struggling to remember who by councillor crackhill seconded by councillor crawshaw i can see I a few nods at that point so i i am going to move to that vote i think so um Gareth, I guess if you could just give us a, a summary basically of where we are um, and then I'll ask Michelle uh, to conduct that vote. Um, so, Chair, the, uh, the, 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 the motion in front of members is that the application is uh, deferred um, in order to allow uh, further discussions to take place with the uh, with the applicants over the provision of uh, an appropriate um, contribution towards affordable housing. And, um, and the, uh, the, the, the list of building consent uh, would, uh, would also be the first um, um, held in the bayance effectively uh, until, uh, until we have a, a final decision on that planning, uh, on the, how the planning application will go forward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw? Yeah, just, just in terms of the, the wording of the deferral, I, I, I think we need to be clear. It's not about further discussion between the, the planning department and the applicant. It's about wanting to go to the independent district valuer. And, and I think it is specifically that we're looking for an independent valuation assess, uh, you know, assessment as to the viability of the, of the project and what a, a, an appropriate level of affordable housing contribution would be. Okay, understood. The decision is though lawfully that of the local planning authority um not the district valuer uh, so we take yeah. their we take their advice um and we also need a decision from the uh if the applicant turns around and says we, we don't want to do that then we'll ref well uh, I, I don't want to that, so. yeah that's where the discussion comes in sorry you slightly froze there gareth when you, Did I? you said also um if you could just repeat your last sentence. I well, guess. it was just the, the the point that we do we do need to we do need to uh, to go back to the applicant um, because uh, if they're not willing for the uh, uh, for the scheme to be referred to the district valuer, then um, then we would return back to members with that um, uh, with that that decision and put it back to members for a, for a decision on the application. I think that's that's fine. Uh, Councillor Craghill, sorry. Uh, just following on from that, so so the wording in our deferral can can though make reference to the district valuer that we're re either requesting or the the developer to go there, or we're giving them the opportunity to go there. Yeah, of course. That, that, that's the that yeah. That's ultimately. The wording. Yeah. Yes, it can. That, ultimately, that, that's what yeah. um, that's what we're seeking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, Councillor Colwick. Just so that we can move quickly to the vote, can I suggest that we do as we often do in these situations and having got to the point where we, uh, that we, that we have, leave it to the, um, the chair and vice chair to agree the final uh, and precise wording of that. Uh, I think we've all understood exactly what we're trying to say. Okay. I can see a few nods there. I'm sure everybody's, yeah. nobody. The final decision actually rests with the developer. He either says yes or he says no, and then it comes back for us to make a decision. Yeah. Okay. I think we've got there. Michelle, are you are you there to conduct the vote? I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it, it's Heidi, senior solicitor. Um, I know reference was made to um, the list of building consent being held in abatement. Just wanted to be clear: there are two applications, so two separate votes needed on that. Yeah. Just wanted to specify that before we move to everybody thinking that we're voting on both. So we'll just need to do two as well, Michelle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Michelle, I think we're we're ready if you're happy to. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a motion to defer the application proposed by Councillor Craghill and seconded by Councillor Crawshaw. Uh, members, please state whether you'll be voting for, against or abstaining. Councillor Craghill. For. Councillor Crawshaw. For. Councillor Cullig. For. 
Councillor Fisher. Or. Councillor Galvin. Or. Councillor Kilbane. Or. Councillor Melly. For. Councillor Oral. For. Councillor Perrett. For. Councillor Ward B. Abstain. Councillor Hollier. For. So that's a 10 um, that are voted to in favour of that motion, so that's carried. Thank you. So yes, that is deferred to a future date. So I'll just um, thank members of the committee for your time tonight and for, for officers. Now Chair, we'll take we the, the second vote. Second vote. Sorry, oh. completely. Having said we needed to do that. Uh, so we'll take the second vote on the list and build a consent. Um, Councillor Craghill? Uh, four. Councillor Crawshaw? Four. Councillor Cullick? Four. Councillor Fisher? Four. Councillor Galvin? Four. Councillor Kilbane? Oh, just to be absolutely clear, this is for deferral, yeah? For the, this is the motion to defer the decision on the list of building consent. Just wanted to make sure. Four. Of course. Sorry, um, sorry that that wasn't clear. Um, Councillor Milley? Four. Councillor Oral? Four. Councillor Perrett? Four. Councillor Wardby? Abstain. Councillor um, Hollier? Four. And so that is carried. Ten votes in favour of that motion. Thank you. So unless there are any more votes, um, I think it's safe to, to thank everybody again for, for your time this evening and particularly uh, all the officers, and particularly those behind the scenes that, that help make this run smoothly. So thank everybody for, for your time. Good night.